So, I hope all of you are here for lightning talks, um, because we've canceled them, and we're now having the all Carols all the time show. I'm just kidding. Carols has been organizing all the speakers, including the lightning talks, um, and keeping everything running. And in fact, all of the angels have been doing a fantastic job keeping uh, the, the things running. Um, so, I, I try and do lightning talks when I can. I apologize again that uh, Nick Farr isn't here. Uh, I think he's on the other side of the river. But uh, I'll take over, uh, because I love lightning talks, and I love seeing people talk about all the crazy projects they're working on, uh, whether they're artistic or technical or social or just plain weird. Uh, that's, that's the fun of the lightning talks. So I guess the first talk, uh, Rabouf, are you here? Yeah? OK, fantastic. So our first talk is going to be from Rabouf, and is a SHA 2017 game review. So come on up here and get set up. Um, and I'll keep chatting with them while you do that. So did everyone sleep well? Yeah? I'm surprised. It was pretty noisy, at least by my tent. Um, and is everybody looking forward to the end of camp? No, of course not. Yeah, exactly. Final day. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, right? So, all right. First talk. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so, all of you got a really awesome badge, um, and I made a little game for the badge. So, maybe a quick show of hands. Did anyone here play the game? Okay, so a couple of you. That, that's really great. So, I'll just show you what the game looks like, and then tell you a little bit about the internals and uh, what we saw happen during the event. When you started the game, you received the fragments. And you were told to share this fragment with other, uh, other people on the field. So you got a color, and you could only share with people with the same color. Um, so if you share, you were asked, do you want to receive or do you want to uh, send? And if you want to receive, you were shown a, a receive code. If you want to send, you had to type in the receiver address. Um, well, after such an ex exchange, you uh, had more fragments. Um, and when you had 25 fragments, you won the game. Um, so congratulations. And uh, the prize was that um, the LEDs, would, which would flash in your team color, would then flash but also sparkle. So how did it work internally? So first thing is, how did you get assigned a color? Well, your color was based on your MAC address. So the last byte of your MAC address, modulo 6, determined your color. How did you get your first fragment? Well, the first fragment was just downloaded from the internet over the Wi-Fi, um, and again, based on your MAC address. Next step of the, the game was how to uh, share uh, the fragments. And the sharing was actually completely peer-to-peer. -peer. So if you were the receiver, your badge would be a Wi-Fi access point, if you were the sender, the badge would connect to the Wi-Fi access point of the receiver, and the fragments would be sent. So every once in a while, you would see a gamer, uh, then a caller, and then the receive code um, in your uh, Wi-Fi access points list. So that was pretty cool, because, I mean, you know how it works. Wi-Fi is not always stable. You could still play the game. Now, final step of the game, how did winning work? This was actually pretty uh, neat. So the fragments were actually um, cryptographic fra fragments in a Shamir, Shamir shared secret thing. Um, so it was actually, uh, if you had 25 fragments, you could decode the original secrets, and uh, then you could use the Wi-Fi to get your prize with secrets. So that was fun. So some statistics, I put it on a game online on, uh, late at day zero. Um, I think we saw the first normal win on day three. And on day four, when I prepared the slides, we saw 700 people who actually downloaded and started the game, and already something like 100 wins. So that was really pretty cool. Now, of course, we are at, Hep at the hacker camp. So there's not just the game. There's also the meta game. People will try to hack the game. Well, of course they did. Um, and I tried to make it a little bit harder for them by min uh, obfuscating the code with PyMinifier. Nothing too fancy, but hmm. Oh. And well, the game opened on day zero. I saw the first people like trying some stuff on day one, and the first successful reverse engineering was on day two. So well done. <coughs> 
So most people attacked the game by just uh, seeing how the fragments were got, uh, the initial fragments were, were uh, downloaded. Um, actually, I thought of that. Uh, my original plan was to have a Wi-Fi uh, physical thing which would give you the initial fragment uh, based on your MAC address. Um, that didn't happen due to hardware failure, and I'm really glad it didn't happen uh, because this made the game much more playable for the normal players. So that's been a good accident. <clears throat> so what kind of responses did I get from the players? Um, things like, oh my god, I'm yellow and everyone I see is blue. Or everyone is yellow. Or everyone is red. So actually, it's like it was pretty evenly distributed, but low sample sizes will kick you in the butt. Other than that, it's been really cool to see people like finding other people and cheering if they're the same color. And I actually spoke to a number of people who said, OK, we wouldn't have met if it weren't for the game. So that's really, really fun. All in all, people seem to have been having a really good time. So that's what we were going for. So I have a couple of people to thank. Uh, first of all, the badge team. Uh, the badge has been a huge volunteer effort. It's been amazing to see. Like the, the hardware, the software, but also like the rallies getting the, the uh, 3,600 packages ready for all the visitors, that's been amazing. I'd like to thank all the players, all the angels which make the event possible, and of course, all of you guys. So I think I have some time. So what would be fun is let's publish the codes. So you can get the um, code from my GitHub page. That's remove slash sha to that as the sifting game. After I made it, ah, oh shit. I'll do it after the talk, sorry. Um, I'll make it public. Uh, have fun, play with it. Um, make another game for your next Hacker event. It's been a really good experience. Thank you very much. Thanks again to... Uh There we go. All right. Thanks again to Rebuff. And um, next up, we've got Beta 4, some more gaming. Um, I believe this talk is about hacking the light infrastructure. Did everyone see the SHA 2017 light installation? And then it changed color to uh, the Italian flag, I believe. Um, so this will be a presentation about that adventure. So. Hi hey everyone, I'm Beta4, and this talk is about uh, how a group of hackers from uh, the Italian Embassy hacked the, the, life, the, the light infrastructure here at the camp. So first things first, credits, because this is a collaborative effort from uh, a so group of hackers. Uh, so thanks everyone. And uh, uh, so how it all started, basically. Uh, the, um, the Italian Embassy is a village here at the camp, it's, uh, it's their tent, and in front of us they put a nice sign saying SHA 2017 with RGB LEDs all around the letters. And it basically started as a joke. Uh, one of us said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could hack the sign to show the colors of the Italian flag? And uh, it is actually dangerous to give good ideas to hackers because we started grouping together and actually doing it. So how did we do it? We had a look at the sign. Behind there was a box with an Arduino-like controller and an Ethernet cable running all the way to a date and clue. And uh, uh, the cable, fortunately for us, ran very close to the Italian embassy. So we started uh, uh, the thinking about doing a man in the middle attack. We brought the cable inside the embassy, connected the switch, and uh, we started sniffing packets, of course. Uh, after uh, uh, basically, the protocol is DMX, which makes sense. It's made for uh, stage lights and everything. And uh, every 20 milliseconds, UDP packets were sent to many uh, EP addresses because each letter has its own EP address. OK, but as you see, we hid in uh, this slide the, the full EP address because we thought, well, for sure, it is a separate uh, network from the one where every one of you are connected, and it is a separate network. For sure, they used VLAN and routing rules to, to prevent anyone here at the camp to connecting them. Nope. 
okay, you, from your computer, could ping the light infrastructure and could set packet to them. And of course, DMX is unauthenticated, and it's UDP. So, and it doesn't even care about the source IP address. So you could just spam it with more packets than the original controller, and you could take control of it. So uh, we took the, uh, one of the packets from the TCP dump, edited with a hex editor to change the color, loaded it in memory in a C++ program, and just flooded it faster than the original controller. The original controller, 20 milliseconds, has every 10 milliseconds. This is the result before with the original animation, and this is the result after with the colors of the Italian flag. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the interesting thing, the interesting thing is that that night, one of us showed up at the Italian embassy saying, hey, I'm the original designer of the sign, could you please give us back control because we have some night animations for the night. <laughs> and uh, we gave them back control, of course, but we started thinking, hey, we know the network number, so we should try to look for other signs. We made a nice application with, uh, you could just put an IP address and hit the pwn button to flood the DMX packet to them. And uh, we scanned the network, of course, for port 6454, which is the one of the MX. We found a lot of things. The third number in the IP address is the date and clock number. The fourth number is the individual device. Some of the date and clock have the 21, 22, 23, so they are the special light installation, but all of the date and clock had 20. What is 20? We targeted the attack as about 20, and it is the flame at the top of the date and clock. And it is a perfect way to spread the Italian flag all over the, uh, all over the embassy. Sorry, all, all over the camp, basically. So we put uh, all of the IP addresses that we could find, not all of them, but most of them, and uh, the next night, all of the lights up uh, top of the dating club were blinking with an Italian flag. <laughs> <laughs> If, if you want to try this at home, uh, be careful with two things. We found that uh, the dumped packets uh, had a maximum brightness of 7F. The maximum is FF. We don't know why still, but we suspect some power limitations. So, so not to let the smoke out of the installation, please keep the brightness low if you try it. And uh, the second thing is that uh, all of the network, due to the Arduino controller limitation, run on a 10 megabit per second of switch. So also keep the traffic low, please. And uh, thank you, everyone, at Shout2000. 17 for providing us with the best Nintendo CTF of my life. Thanks. Fantastic. All right. So next up, we've got Jan coming to speak to us about blockchains um, and about hacking blockchains. In the meantime, a little bit of housekeeping. So I heard that the uh, merchandise <coughs> can't be shipped to you if you pre-ordered it but you can go and still pick it up from the shops. So if you've pre-ordered something, go and pick it up from the shops. Um, yesterday they were saying they were running out of items, but you can still ship them to Benelux and Germany if you want to purchase things. Um, all set? No? OK. So um, yeah, was there any other housekeeping? I can't remember. What was the sale? So there is a sale. What was the price? Is it 20% off? Is it 30% off? Okay, they're selling merchandise in a shop. <laughs> <laughs> News at 11, right? Um, I'm just here to kill time. Here's the real pretty face. Um, so go ahead and tell us about hacking blockchains. Nope. Um, oh, welcome. Uh, this talk was original, a uh, 99 second talk. So I thought, let's expand it to uh, a lightning talk. And, um, well, it's basically we have a nice camp here at the Hacker Festival, and we hear something about blockchains, but I'm like, I'm not really seeing the hacking things in blockchains. And, well, since it's important technology with a big impact, I think we should. So, the biggest uh, known blockchain is, of course, Bitcoin. And, uh, well, after takeaway.com, orders via uh, Bitcoin, we now have tricks paying for as the song says that came out in 2014. Um, well, that Bitcoin is the biggest implementation of a blockchain, but if you go way further, you get to Ethereum, which is actually a programming language to deploy this kind of thing. So I give a uh, description how a blockchain works. You have all kinds of transactions to get into a uh, 
to be stored in the database. Every ten minutes for Bitcoin, um, it gets stored in the uh, blockchain, and uh, also the address of the or hash of the for, um, previous block is put into the block. And so if you put all the blocks together, you have a big database. So here we are at the camp, and we see all these really important topics going on, like uh, the big uh, companies, Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft are owning all our stuff. Governments attack our rights, hack our computers, and they have no clue what they're doing. And, well, the best of IoT fails, electronic locks fails, and out, there's only all our people's computers. So, add to that the blockchains, which allow for a global, distributed, uncensorable, unchangeable, irreversible, real-time database. Just think of all the great things you can do with it, and project that on the previous topics we had. How did I get into it? Well, it started in 2013. I thought, Bitcoin. Hey, it reached 20 euros, shouldn't that be that? This can't work. I start to figure out, okay, uh, this can't work. Oh, crap, it does. And then you go to deeper down the rabbit hole, like all the other companies now do. So we used to have mainframes, which did everything for uh, aeroplanes and um, air traffic and uh, power infrastructure. Now we do everything on the cloud, everything moves to Amazon because they're the biggest and cheapest and Jeff Bezos doesn't want to make any profit, so he reinvests everything. And, but he also doesn't want to maintain all those computers, so we go to put everything on the blockchain and we don't know where everything is. So, how did we get here? This is a possible scenario. We started with Bitcoin in 2009. Then in 2015, Ethereum got developed, and people, um, yeah, you have some uh, smart contracts on a global mini computer, like a sort of Python interpreter on a global mini computer where everybody agrees on. And now all the kids are going crazy. Your developers quit at 20 to retire, and then one year later, they come back to rip apart your marketplace and take you over. Um, but one of the limitations is that big data. Blockchain is really difficult at this moment, but the kids and the hackers are really busy getting that going. So all the users jump in, and after that, the financials, the big stacks also go for it. Government won't be able what to do. And in 2020, people are like, okay, crap, what happened? Where are my rights? Why is everything on the blockchain? I can get at it. And then after that, the horrible things happen, because if you make really complex, uh, smart stuff, something really so, we should start hacking blockchains and start a new blockchain. And we can start, of course, with the blinking LED uh, on a blockchain and also start the discussions. But I think we really need, as an open initiative, or initiative, we need our own blockchain, but we also need to start the discussion with the other blockchains and the people that are using them. Excellent. Now my, yeah, it is working. Okay, good. <clears throat> so um, anybody here been here all three days for lightning talks? Any serial offenders? Yeah, but you work here. <laughs> uh, ah, yes, one of our speakers from the first day has made it all three days. So then, so then you will remember that we have a, a lightning talk legend here. Lightning talk department, genesis.re, here to speak. Uh, uh, but I have my own microphone. Exactly. Here to speak free. About it feels uh, so amazing. command and control. So I believe the pre previous speaker was talking about the uh, rabbit hole of blockchain and all the places that it could go. Um, you see how we've uh, spared no expense, and he is indeed wearing a white rabbit T-shirt, just uh, to uh, symbolize exactly what uh, you were talking about. I am, so. I'm almost there. I just need to uh, hack my own website because this uh, little video obstructs the better view, and I didn't have a chance to make my own slides because everything is improvised, everything is work in progress. Okay. And uh, I love energy coming from this place so much. Next year, I'm opening my own stage so that I could talk forever. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so uh, basically I gave this talk two years ago at the uh, Chaos Communication Camp. And today, when they gave me this microphone, I just cannot help each other. I just, I just, I just must do it. I started doing yoga because I had some uh, back issues, sitting on the computer, very, you know, not optimal posture. So I just want to show you like one or two very super basic exercises. And whenever you go to a yoga class, this is like a warm-up exercise. So there is like a no, no nothing serious. It is just to gently uh, warm you up. And by the way, I need to admit that about uh, genders and the sexuality, usually when you go to a yoga class, you are one of the very few men. And back in the day, seeing girls going to yoga classes was one of my main motivations. <laughs> I'm not guarantee that you get laid, but if you have a higher energy, better physique, if you are just hanging out in right circles, okay, so let's do this. So this is called the sun salutation, and first what you do is just the hands up, then you bend over, you just look back, then you just jump to the back, then a little push up, then you look up, look down. This is called a downward dog, and usually we stay here for, 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 for a few breaths. I usually like to move my, move my ass, move my <laughs> legs, and then we, we go to the front, uh, we bend, and all the way up, sometimes a little bit further. And basically what it does, it just works on your, the whole body, your spine feels well. So I just do this again. Uh, we, we look up, we, we bend, look up, walk, or here we have some, here we have some variations. Uh, look up, boom, boom, boom. And this is basically a very simple exercise that you can do in any place, at the airport, on the grass. You do not need to have a, a yoga mat or anything. It, it just works. Another exercise that I enjoy is like touching, touching the ground and uh, hands up, and then the other side. I just feel like all my arms and legs are, are stretching, and it is just... I just feel in my body, yes, my body feels good, my body feels amazing. <sighs> Another very simple exercise, because all of this is, is super simple, it doesn't really require any special fitness or, or anything, uh, is for, 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 for instance, uh, you just... <laughs> I do not know what is, the, what is the official name, but also I can feel all my muscles working, uh, my arms stretching, it is just... <sighs> And you can go on and on and on, and then at, at some point you just know, oh, I, have a, I feel something in this part of my body, and then you just do a special exercise that is meant to relieve your pain in that section. And this can go on and on forever. I'll try to do something crazy. I'm not sure if it will work. Don't do this at home. Never do this on the stage. <laughs> okay, one more. One more. It is the last day. I've been tired, I didn't get much sleep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it takes some time, it takes some practice, but the journey, the journey never ends. Life is about the journey. Enjoy the process, enjoy the ride. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Is it working? Also a serial offender was here on the first day, as I, as I recall. Yesterday. Yesterday, second yes. day. Okay. So Polto is here to speak to us about... Uh, about bullshit. Bullshit. About bullshit. Basically what I do up here. Mainly bullshit. Yeah, do you know yeah, what the yeah, difference between a uh, lightning talk it's coordinator fine. and a pizza is? I don't have slides. A pizza can feed a family of four. Ah. Is your microphone working? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, good. Seems to. Hi. So, I'm here to talk to you about bullshit, and a very specific bullshit. So, first, thank you for the talk about um, blockchains and uh, that we need to hack the blockchains. I also think so. So, thank you very much. Uh, probably, most of you already heard about uh, blockchains, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all the ICOs going on. 
Uh, most of that ICOs, for those who don't know, initial coin offering are scam, bullshit, Ponzi schemes. Most of them, like probably 95%. So I got an idea, why not create some bullshit token? So we created a bullshit ERC20 token on Ethereum, and it's currently on the market. You can buy bullshit on Ether Delta Decentralized Exchange. There are many fancy tokens that you can buy, like FAC token, like the useless Ethereum token. There are many useless tokens that make fun of the currently useless and scammy ICOs. So we built this. Uh, currently, it's actually useless, but we will try to make something like a, a bullshit proof of consensus, uh, bullshit proof of, proof of consensus algorithm to prove that bullshit ICOs are bullshit. So we want to mark them with this coin as pure bullshit. So people want to invest in them and would pay more attention before they invest in some ICOs. So uh, the website is currently, uh, it was published for the SHA 2012, so it's really uh, ugly and uh, quickly done. It's hosted on GitHub, so feel free to do pull requests to make it better. We have a brown paper that describes uh, slightly how the thing works. And we also, for like increased security, we issued a special free sheet uh, toilet paper wallet. So it's very secure. Please participate to the project. Thank you very much. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> um, it did smell a bit like cow patties for a moment there while that was going on. I don't know if that's just wafting in field. People can move that. But our uh, next speaker is going to talk to us about next generation internet. Uh, Michael Leniers? Yeah, right? Michiel Leniers. Michiel Leniers, okay. So, um, you know that moment when you, uh, when you go to a wedding and they say, speak up now or forever hold your breath? So, I work for a charity called Anelnet Foundation. We were way back in the 80s. Uh, we were part of the, the, the beginning of the internet in Europe. It was a uh, a time when Unix bearded guys, uh, actually were all young people, and they set up this, this network just for each other, and then that grew into the European internet. And we've been giving money to people that do this kind of thing, uh, uh, even to this conference itself, but to people that fix the internet. Uh, so we're a charity, we give money to people. And last year, something came in our path, because we found out that the European Commission was, um, they were starting a new research and development program, and, and these things are big. I mean, think hundreds of millions of euros, potentially billion of euros. And they were sort of putting the challenge in front of the community, saying, okay, is anybody there out there to tell us what we should be funding? And we looked back and we thought, the last 20 years what you've been funding is crap. The internet is still very much fossilized, ossified in the in the, in the first generation, there, we, we are still using IPv4 everywhere, we're still using DNS uh, with, without security, we, 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 don't, we have not upgraded our technology stack. And then we looked at how they, how they were faring, and they were always getting these big consortia in with, with tele, telephone companies. And then, for some reason or another, we were able to actually uh, get into the process, and we're now writing the, uh, the plans for the European Commission, their official vision for the next generation internet. And um, we, we are not doing this by ourselves. We, we, we hooked up with uh, a number of ex uh, communities like uh, the FSFE, EDRI, uh, but also the technical community, the people that run the internet, that like the RIPE, uh, the, the people that run the domain names. But obviously these organizations do not have a complete overview. And so that's what I said, the, mo the moment where you can speak up about what is wrong with the internet or what, what your wishes are, what is wrong, if you yell it to us now, we will produce it ad verbatim to the European Commission. So, unless it's total obscene bullshit crap. But otherwise, if you have a, a meaningful thing, and it doesn't have to be long, but if you have anything meaningful to contribute, saying uh, either a political issue or a technical issue, you can uh, report it to us. We have this website up uh, uh, called, and, and it's, it's actually apt to be next to this thing because we're talking about alternate realities. So I'm in front of the thing, this is not the internet. Google is not the internet. We can actually make the better internet tomorrow if all of us work together. 
And uh, so I'm asking you, and asking the help of this community, if you talk to people, if you know anybody that is always bitching about how the internet should be improved in one way or another, tell us, because now we have the opportunity, we have uh, sort of, we've hacked the process to, 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 uh, uh, to, to make the commission understand uh, that it's public money that should go to a public resource, the, the internet is a commons, and we really, really, really need your brain power to, to find a, well, just like the, we, don't, we want this Italian flag on top of the internet, right? We want it back, we want to own the thing, and uh, we want to, to, to strain every muscle that we have in our bodies to make, now finally grab this, what, I mean, I've been uh, working in this, this sphere for a long, long time, from almost my entire life. This is the best opportunity I've seen to get actual real large public money go to the things that we care about. So I hope that you go to uh, our website, which is called nlnet.nl. It's easy, you're in the Netherlands now. There's only one network in the 80s, so it was called nlnet. From there on, uh, you click on the top right link, uh, and it's all about next generation internet, or you, you look for that. And any input that you will give us, we, we promise to treat very carefully and look at it. And if you, uh, I'm here, so you can just grab a card, and please talk to us. Uh, and send, send us any idea that you have. Okay, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. So we don't have a full set. We have two hours today for lightning talks. To do a lightning talk. It's all right, I can work with half a microphone. So anyone, anyone, anyone? If you don't speak, I'm going to have to put Genesis RE up here again to do more yoga and keep things going. It's going to keep going. Come on, and anyone do the public workshop? We already picked on you yesterday, so you know not to raise your hands this time, right? I know one of the uh, angels was in the workshop. Opportunity, public speaking. We only have two more talks. We have two hours to fill. Oh God, it's endless. All right, worth a try. Matthias is here to speak to us about uh, privacy scores, which I think is pretty cool, so I'm going to let him do that. Um, and feel free to take an extra minute, since we have, you know, two hours. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I will talk about Privacy Score, a public scanning platform to assess privacy issues of websites, our motivation. When I'm visiting a website uh, that... Um, informs about social support. I want to know who knows that also. So there are tools like Privacy Badger that show me trackers, but there are also other um, scanning services. You might uh, know some of them. Most of them are focused on single site scans. For example, there is SSL Labs. Um, SSL Labs creates an overall rating and uh, shows you if your SSL config is bad or or not that bad. Then there's also security headers IO. They show you if you have uh, nice uh, HTTP headers or not. Other uh, other websites to mention are the Mozilla Observatory or uh, WebCall. WebCall shows you lots of cookies, third-party re requests, and so on and so forth. But the existing scanning services are only useful uh, for admins that do ad hoc scanning, and they use a predefined um, evaluation methodology. We want to change that. So we created Privacy Score. Um, the goals are um, we want to create incentives for providers to improve their security and their privacy by publishing our results as a ranked benchmark. The user can influence his or her ranking the source code is open source, and all results are published as open data. A nice thing is that user can uh, define their own site properties. That makes it easy to um, understand the list that I created. I will show you that in one slide. Question I could answer then are something like, do Bavarian cities perform better than schools in Hamburg, or is the size of a hospital correlated with its rank on privacy score? So I will show you a few screenshots first. This is a list named um, European Data. I for forgot the last thing. And um, there are 36 websites in this list. Zero of them passed all the checks we have so far. 19 failed at least one or more checks. And 11 failed at least one critical check. 
Then you scan a bunch of websites, such a ranking created. You have on the left the list of URLs. Then you can have one or more uh, user-defined columns. And on the right side, you have um, certain categories like uh, tracking, encrypted web, attacks, encrypted mail, and in the end, the overall rating. Um, if you click on a domain, you can see um, the results in detail. Here, for example, the no tracking results. Uh, most checks are working. Some are not working yet or unreliable. Yeah, check out our source code. You can contact us via Twitter, by mail. Try it out. Um, since I have a minute left, I will show you the website itself. Here it comes. So you can upload a new list. You can, uh, of course, single, uh, scan a single site if you want to. And it's pretty easy to create the own list. It's just a CSV file, comma separated, and yeah, try it out. That's it. Fantastic. All right, and even on time. I'm not used to all the uh, Lightning Talk speakers uh, running absolutely on time. Um, you thought I was kidding, but we really do need speakers. So if you are streaming this, if you are out there in the ether, please come to the, uh, to the RE tent. Otherwise, it's going to become the Genesis RE tent for the next hour. Because we were in the bar last night, and he was showing me all the projects that he's got. And he's got plenty of projects. I'm just kidding. He's going to give us another five or six minutes. And then we do have two other new speakers who've bravely stood up to come and join us. So um, let's have more of that. OK, I wasn't, You're not I wasn't on the screen. kidding that I have uh, many projects. At some point, I did a meta project, 50 projects in 50 days, because I know that ideas, creativity are infinite, but then it is back to implementation, execution, processes, and actually getting shit done. I am good at getting shit started. And uh, I would like to just show you a high level overview of, of some of the stuff. This, this project is called Renaissance, RNS, SNC, and these are various, various projects. Uh, like one project per day, me doing very quick presentation. Here is the problem, here is the solution, here is uh, the existing example, here is how it makes money. And first, it starts from cannabis, which is the fastest growing industry in the US, and hemp, which is a non-psychoactive uh, uh, variation. And on the first day, I gave the talk about the legal history of hemp and uh, cannabis. And uh, second, and then I realized, after all these 20 projects, initially, I set up to, to 50. But in the process, I realized that I need to first work on the workspace so I could realize all these projects. And that's how working on the astral ship started. Astral ship is a building in the North Wales in the, in the UK. We have this building and we convert it into a visionary space to realize human potential and heal the planet. We have enough taxi or food delivery apps. We need to work on actual problems that matter. And here at the Shah, so much work is invested into infrastructure, toilets, water. It is completely unsustainable, honestly, so much work. So that is why we invest in the buildings we already have. And this is our second building. This building is a ruin. You see the collapsed roof. Uh, this building requires a lot of investment from a local council, a government, European Union, uh, some lottery fund. But hey, we have two buildings. We are all hackers. We are organizing an event uh, 22, 23, 24th of September. I'll show you the link to the event. And please, you are invited. It is not fun to build a community and no one arrives. We actually anticipate you to come. And some people will arrive early. Some people will stay for an extended period of time. So, this is it, two buildings, and the invitation is right there, astralship slash uh, equinox. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so this is it, 20, 
22, 23, 24 of September, you are invited to, to arrive early and, 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 and stay longer if required. Because we anticipate that some people will decide, huh, it makes sense, it is cool, I want to stay. So we are more than welcome to stay for long. We are based in Wales. Flying to London is okay, but it's better when you fly to Liverpool or Manchester. It's just uh, much, much closer. And uh, this is something my, my friend is doing. And, 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 and we are like piggy, piggybacking on, on his idea. First Global Solutions Day. We have all the solutions to all the, all the human problems. It is just the uneven distribution. There are some, I would say, there are some like a prawns, a shrimps, like these little uh, things that live in the, in the water, and they are caught in, in the Netherlands. They are shipped to Morocco when they are peeled, and then shipped back to Holland, and then there are subsidies to pay for export taxes and import taxes. It's ridiculous. Or salmon caught in Norway, and then it is shipped to, to China, and then back to... It doesn't make any sense at all. But we have two buildings. We organize the event. You are more than welcome to join us. And by the way, I know this is not very popular. Uh, do I have time? Cool. I have a strange relationship with Google. Because Google, in my opinion, is the most powerful company on the planet. They are actually more powerful than any government. Uh, for instance, they have access to all the knowledge all the books, they have access to our emails, search history, and of course there are some privacy advocates that are not using Google, but on a larger scale, Google has all the information, all the thoughts, and they are investing in the browser, operating system, phones, laptop, telecom infrastructure, uh, fiber, uh, loon. So this is only technology, but now they are also expanding into uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, self-driving cars, robots. They purchase all, all the robotics company. They purchase all deep learning company. They have uh, also the biggest private investors in uh, SpaceX via Google Ventures. So all the knowledge, all the information, all the deep learning, all the robots, space technology, and recently also a nuclear fusion. So Google quite literally owns the planet. They are ubiquitous. I treat Google as oxygen. And I know that my, my, my security systems, when I'm in this room, you are much better at hacking than me. And when I am defending my systems, I need to be lucky all the time. You, as an attacker, you have to be lucky only once. I am relying on Google when doing my infrastructure, because Google owns the planet. Google is already mo more powerful than any government. And I'm not sure if you know it. Uh, you may have heard of the Rothschild family. Uh, they, they are, there's the famous family of bankers, Rothschild family. It will give you some uh, Wikipedia links. They have many, many multiple generations. They were fun of financing both sides of the war. Uh, how do you make money? You just sell arms to both sides, and then whoever wins, you, you have money. So, so this is one very famous family. And the second very famous thing is Bilderberg Group. And believe me or not, the Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, is actually one of the chairmen of this organization. So uh, Google owns the planet. I signed peace treaty with Google because they, they own it. Mm. They own it. However, if you have better ideas, we can work on the alternative. I'm inviting you to our place, the Equinox Gathering. We have two buildings. We need more hackers. We need more people. And you are invited to stay as long as you like. Just take your laptop, take a sleeping bag, take, pack yourself in a way that you don't want to go home. Just get yourself ready. We are starting something. Mm. Don't forget your laptop. So there you go. You have it. An invitation to a party in Snowdonia. Anyone been to Snowdonia? Really? Okay, good. It's beautiful, right? It's worth, worth a visit. 
Okay, so uh, I do want to remind people there's still space for speakers, whether you're online streaming or whether you're here in the room. Um, the traditionally overrepresented gender has been traditionally overrepresented in these particular lightning talks. So I would like to invite all genders to come and give lightning talks. If anyone is still interested, come and see the angels at the front of the room. Uh, run down here from your tents and give us a talk. Benjamin was here yesterday and I believe was part of the free software choir, which was quite a finale. Did anybody catch that? The one person who is here all three days, right? Okay, we all caught it, right? You actually work for us, don't you? No? No? You really just volunteered to see all three days of lightning talks? You deserve a round of applause. <laughs> all right, Benjamin, hey, am I take on? it away. Am I on? Yes. Oh. Ignorieren. Um, yes, so yesterday I was, uh, we were singing with the choir and um, I thought I, I'd talk a bit about it. So um, it all started with that at the last uh, C3 Congress, I noticed that at the, tent, uh, at the table of the Free Software Foundation Europe, twice a day people would meet to sing and not everybody liked it because it was amateur singers and they also had a flute. But I thought, <laughs> you know, you, to, to make something great, you need motivation and you need skill. They already have motivation, so maybe I could... Uh, so. And so I took the song and made a choral arrangement, and I just wanted to make a comment about it. I put the melody in the tenor part because I expected more men than women on a tech conference. Um, and we did perform it yesterday. And uh, for me, it was great. It was the first time that I conducted something. Uh, but I want to do it again. And so now, basically, what I'm trying here is to find people to work with. So um, if there are people who want to make music that glorifies um, open source software, please talk to me. <laughs> um, so we can make something cool on the next Congress. I, would be, I, I, I think I like the idea with the choir, and I would like to optimize for having a great experience while singing in the choir. So this song that we had was very fast, and so people did not really have time to listen. And it's, it's quite some magic that evolves when you, you learn that line that you have to sing, and then you sing with someone together, and suddenly it, it sounds. And I would like to find, I, I would like to make music um, that is more optimized on that, so it should have more harmony and more dynamics. Um, yes, so I'm basically looking for collaborators, people who have text, because I cannot write text, I can write music and other musicians. And so maybe we'll have a choir again at another event. That would be cool. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so right now we're on to our last talk. So I'm disappointed in you. Shame on you. No? OK, we've got two more talks. Fantastic, actually. We're starting to recycle uh, speakers. So Rabouf is up here to speak to us about something new uh, compared to half an hour ago. Yep. Uh, so you've evolved a lot in that time. You've <laughs> written a lot of code. It's all up on GitHub, uh, I understand. Is that true? Yes. No? All right, what are you going to speak to us about? Um, I'd like to do a quick pitch, for the, uh, quick pitch for the reproducible builds project. So I'm not affiliated, but I'm a fan. Um, so the reason I want to do the pitch is um, who of you ships software? Ah, that's a good number of you. So it could be a library or a program. And when you ship software, it would be really bad if you shipped a backdoor to your uh, users, right? But if anything, uh, if you should learn anything from going to a hacker camp is that you don't know if you've been hacked. Um, so how can you know that when you publish your software, you haven't been hacked and you're not publishing a backdoor to your users? So that's a really hard problem, because you can like, say, OK, I use a continuous integration server, but hey, maybe the continuous integration server is hacked. So that's a hard problem. And the reproducible builds project is aimed to, well, maybe not fix the problem, but uh, contribute to the fix. And the idea is really simple. Uh, a project that has a reproducible build, if you take the same version of the code, it always produces the same binary, like byte per byte uh, the same binary. And then you can just uh, build it on several machines. The chance that all of them are hacked is small, and you have uh, more confidence that there's no backdoor going to your users. Um, so typically, um, builds are not reproducible because there's timestamps in there and uh, lists that are ordered in random fashion. Um, but it's a really worthwhile ca cause. The Debian project has done a lot of work creating tools to make it much easier. So look into it. It's really recommended. 
Thanks. Thanks. So it's raining out, and it looks like we might have some lightning a little bit. So the lightning talks are actually going to be lightning talks. Hopefully, that will drive more people into the room and onto the stage. Maybe give a lightning talk all at the same time. Uh, so again, recycling another speaker. Uh, he's going to speak to us about a hardware project, I believe, this time, once he gets everything set up. Um, has everyone packed up their tents? Now would be a good time to do it. Maybe not. Maybe not. I packed mine up earlier. I put it inside another tent because I like recursion. Um, I think they took that tent down, so my tent is now inside a tent that's been packed away, inside another tent that's been packed away. Um, hey, do you use Nixos? Hmm? Is this Nixos, your operating system? No, it's no? Uh, Debian. Oh, okay. Met KD. I uh, recognize the background, and I thought maybe you were a Nixos user. Okay, I hope this. Ah, okay. All right, here we go. Um, Last lightning talk, unless somebody comes up here and volunteers. Aha. Uh -huh. This is a talk I did a couple of years ago based on hardware outsourcing because I, in a previous life I was a hardware engineer and it was the only time it went actually right in a complete co-creation fashion. This used to take one and a half hours, so um, here we go. <laughs> it's about that box, this is about me. Well, everybody knows how outsourcing projects go. And Boeing also has learned that the hard way. Um, this is a product we worked on, which was an X-ray machine for Philips, and when we were almost done, I was like, okay, it went so well, I went to my manager, can I publish everything I learned here, and said, well, we can uh, release everything anyway in a couple of months, so be my guest, so that's great. This is the basic layout, you have your stuff for your patient, control room, and lots of 19-inch cabinets in the back, logical view, and this was the old crappy situation, which was obsolete, and we went to this and Philips didn't have any mechanical engineers, so we needed to outsource. Uh, cable overview, and this is how it looked like. This is nicely done in Inkscape, and this is how you mount it below a table in your lab. And, well, main point of this talk is if you start outsourcing, white box or black box outsourcing, it's all crap. Everybody should specify in what they're capable of, and Everybody can use the tools they want to use, and you communicate using open standards like PDF or whatever. Um, requirement engineering, uh, what kind of level? Uh, yeah, not important. Okay, don't invent the wheel. Buy stuff. Harass everyone that you need stuff. Um, make a good specification, peer review it, always peer review it. Make a prototype to see if your specification is correct. And then you will start really outsourcing because what your customer sees here is what your supplier did here. And make sure that your supplier also knows what he's making and for who is it making. And this is the only interface you have to your supplier. So get that right and get the trust with your supplier. Well, then the mechanical engineer at the supplier start uh, engineering, so you give him all your stuff, including the requirement specification. He sends back an uh, AXI with a 3D model. You uh, hack and slash and annotate it. You send it back, and 24 hours later, you got uh, your next iteration, and six weeks later, you got your first of a kind hardware. Then you start testing. Of course, uh, EMC is crap. It's all it is. So, and then uh, you solve all your change requests, uh, problem reports, you archive the whole design because it needs to be in the field 12 years or 20 years, and you deploy it at your beta site. Tools, well, I use the GIMP for making a simple PCB thing, and specifications also give a good link to uh, some EMC requirements, but for your netlist, use a real schematic program, and you get your Gerber bags. For a mechanical, I used Inkscape. It was a real one-on-one -on -one printed sheet, so I could easily hang it under the table before we got the real hardware, and it actually went quite well. Cables, this I don't see anywhere. People always try to make harnesses. 
and the use the most difficult specification to take a lot of work is just use open office, create a table with five columns, specify connect on one side, connect the other side, what is in the middle, what needs to be a twisted pair, and you get your nice cable drawings back out again. And when it's not worth the trouble, you don't outsource it, you do it yourself. So, um, yeah, outsourcing, it takes you yourself one third to a quarter of the effort that it takes to outsource. So for one people, you, for three people you have running around at the outsource party, you have one people running in-house. That's it. Thank you very much. I never thought I'd enjoy a talk about outsourcing, but I did. I actually learned a few things. That was pretty cool. Um, can you imagine if all lightning talks were done by management? Wouldn't that be great? Management strategies? I think that would be your conference. No? Okay, never make that joke ever again. <laughs>